So I want to talk a little bit about the Chinese media and Sino-Anglo relations in relation to this. Um, there's been something of a controversy in the last few days over footage that emerged of the Queen um, exchanging in a conversation with a female police officer, um, senior police officer. And in this conversation, it was filmed, um, the Queen is is told by the officer that Chinese diplomatic staff were very rude during the state visit. And um, the Queen kind of reciprocates these sentiments by saying, um, um, how unfortunate for you, or something along those lines. But basically, if you check out the original video, which I'll try and post in this, um, you'll see what I mean. Um, there's a bit of an issue here because, uh, I mean, here in the UK, there's people are saying that our media is making a bit of a mountain out of a molehill with this. And that was more or less the position I took. I thought, well, it's not really a big deal. Um, it's not like she was saying this privately it was in a public area. Um, some have said that she should have been more closely guarded. But, you know, I think it's good that our head of state says what's on her mind. I don't think that it should be a case of everything behind closed doors. Um, and this is hardly the controversy of the century. It's not like... She's come out with a massive insult against the Chinese. She basically agreed that some diplomatic staff were rude. It wasn't the case that she was slandering the whole nation of China. Um, so that was that. And I thought, OK, well, this is the BBC and Channel 4 and so on making a bigger issue than it really is. Within China, um, the BBC reported that their coverage of this has been censored. And they even showed in their Beijing bureau um as they were reporting this, I think it was the BBC World Day, which is the new name for the World Service. As it was about to come on, it just blanked out. They even showed that directly in their BBC, in their Beijing studio, um, which is not surprising because that's usually the approach that Chinese state media takes um, whenever there's a controversy. Um, but something else has emerged and uh, I want to touch on this. There is a newspaper known as the Global Times. It was established in 1993. Its English language version was uh, set up in 2009. It's based in Beijing. It's a bit different from other Chinese newspapers in that it takes a more tabloid format. But what's not different about it is that it is absolutely controlled by the Communist Party. There is no free media in China, um, certainly not in terms of media that reports the news. There just doesn't exist because the government has absolute iron grip on all media. Um, you know, there's different levels, but it is basically all controlled by the Communist Party. There is no truly independent media in China. That's a fact. Um, now, what's interesting about Global Times, uh, I've just looked in the, at an article on Shanghaiist, and I have to say, I sometimes take articles published on Shanghaiist with a pinch of salt. The Shanghaiist can be a bit sensationalist. It's an English language website on Facebook, and I think it's purportedly run by Westerners. So I think sometimes it's a bit trivial, and um, I don't always take it very seriously. So to kind of play the devil's advocate, I, I look directly at the Global Times website, the English language version. Now, the thing about their English language version is it's pretty inoffensive. They tend to cover, and this is true of Xinhua as well, the stories that they report tend to be very trivial, light-hearted things. You know, it's mostly about cuddly animals, and most of it isn't even political. It's very kind of down-to-earth issues, and it's very, very inoffensive, very diplomatic, um, not even particularly political. However, I then looked at the Chinese-language version. I put on the translator, and it is quite a different story. That does indeed um, solidify the claim that Shanghaiist was making. That their take on this thing with the Queen is that they basically go into a long rant about um, British and it closes with talking about the British and the West in general have built a great civilization. Um, however, that is overshadowed by barbarian media. Barbarian? This is a very strong word. Um, 
who spread malicious gossip about China and um, they can learn from 5,000 years of civilization. So this was straight from the horse's mouth. This wasn't from Shanghaiist. This wasn't from the BBC. This is what I just read directly on the Global Daily. Um, and yeah, I have a few things to say about that. First, see this figure of 5,000 years that keeps being thrown out by Chinese nationalists. Um, it's not 5,000 years, it's 4,000 years. And most Chinese archaeologists will say that. 4,000 years uh, going back to the um, Zhou dynasty. In fact, the Shang dynasty. If you look at the dating of that dynasty, it is nowhere near 5,000 years. It's close to 4,000 years, about 3,800. Um, I don't know where this figure of 5,000 years constantly comes from. If they're talking about prehistoric sites, you can find prehistoric sites everywhere in the world that go back hundreds of thousands of years. So this constant line of 5,000 years of Chinese civilization, it's 4,000 years of Chinese civilization, which is still ancient. It's still rich history, but it's 4,000 years, not 5,000 years. Because if we determine civilization to be the establishment of cities, the establishment of government, the establishment of a clearly defined culture, then it's 4,000 years, not 5,000 years. Um, but that might be a passing fleeting point. Anyway, as for Britain learning from that, um, although I agree in principle that countries can learn from one another, I would say to any communist publication to be very, very careful about pointing fingers. Sure, the BBC and Western outlets point fingers as well. The fundamental difference, though, is this. In the West, in Britain, and this is the point I always make, we have plenty of faults. The fundamental difference, though, is that we can read about our past. We can debate our past. We can basically find out all the crimes and all the evils of the British Empire. We can read about the Opium Wars and all the exploitation that caused towards China. The difference is this. In China, people cannot freely read about the crimes of Chairman Mao. They cannot freely read and discuss the terrors of the Red Guards. And they cannot freely talk about the events of 1989. They just can't. The situation may be better than the 60s, but gradually uh, Xi's administration has been clumping down in a way that hasn't been seen for a very long time, in a way that's a lot more draconian. The Xi administration is relying on ultranationalism because they know that communism is an abysmal failure. So they're relying on ultranationalism. And unfortunately, it's working. Xi Jinping has recently been voted as one of the most admired leaders in the world. So he's basically doing a Putin. He's sort of flexing his muscles and showing that he's the strong Chinese leader. I think the world needs to be very cautious with this man. I'm not saying that Xi Jinping is another Mao Zedong. I don't think he is. But nevertheless, he's playing the same game as Putin. And that's very, very dangerous because when you have that sort of ultra-nationalistic agenda, there's no scope for debate. There's no scope for alternative viewpoints. Um, that goes hand in hand with a single party regime that does not tolerate dissent. Say what you want about the West. Say what you want about whatever faults we have. But I absolutely, I am absolutely adamant that we are a lot more transparent by nature. Because when you have democracy in place, you have opposition, you have critical opinions. In the UK, for example, there are many editorials that criticise the royal family. There's cartoons that openly ridicule the royal family. Um, we have an active opposition, opposition parties, plural, in place that regularly question and scrutinise the government. We have, sure, our media is biased, I'm not disputing that. But at least there's two sides of the bias. We have right-wing bias and we have left-wing bias. We don't really have British bias. So when the likes of Global Times talk about um, Western media, they're forgetting that Western media isn't a, sing a single unit, unlike Chinese media, which is entirely communist-controlled. You know, there are people in the UK that actually believe the BBC is a communist organisation because it's very left-wing. So 
those are a lot of interesting points. Global Times is showing two faces. They're kind of putting on this nice, friendly, amicable face to Western readers, but there is another side to Global Times. Now, to be fair to them, I suppose I have to be fair in all of this. Um, their track record isn't entirely consistent with other Chinese communist publications. For example, they have been strangely amicable towards Japan. Uh, they have argued in one of their editorials, apparently, that Japan isn't getting increasingly militaristic, and they were they had supportive comments after the Tohoku earthquake. Now, that's a welcome thing. That's something that's good that comes out of this. But calling the British barbarians um, is a little bit like the pot calling the kettle black. Um, Chinese publications that are run by the Communist Party have no moral high ground over anyone. This is a country that, um, this is government, I should say, that 